abortion opponents have taken that complex reality to a disturbing extreme, with the hope of convincing the public and lawmakers that ending a pregnancy puts many women at significant risk for mental health problems like substance abuse, depression, and suicide. To vividly and persuasively make their case, anti-abortion rights activists often point to scientific research that makes dubious connections between the medical procedure and long-term psychological turmoil or suffering. What politicians looking to restrict abortion don't tell the public is that not all research in this field is equal. This strategy has found its way into state houses across the country. A recent report from the Guttmacher Institute, a research and advocacy organization, found that more than half of all women of reproductive age in the U.S. live in a state with at least two types of abortion restrictions that have no basis in scientific evidence including counseling requirements and mandatory waiting periods. Not all of these laws are explicitly premised on the notion that abortion causes lasting emotional or psychological damage, but many are routinely defended as measures to protect women's health. I don't think requirements are the solution to anything, said Melissa Madera, who has interviewed 288 people about their abortion experiences, as founder and director of the podcast The Abortion Diary. No one needs to tell us that we need to take time to think. People are doing it anyway. Meanwhile, a battle over the science of abortion and mental health continues to unfold. Reputable medical and professional organizations in the field have found that the procedure doesn't cause long term psychological harm, but a group of researchers insist it's devastating. The losers in this fight? People who've had or may need an abortion and hear conflicting messages about the research, and who may face long waits to get care because of laws designed to slow the process. While many women who've had abortions can share how the experience affected them, scientists can't rely on these anecdotes to draw conclusions about mental health for an entire population. Instead, the best scientific research minimizes bias and controls for variables. When randomized trials are possible, scientists can recruit volunteers who are then assigned different outcomes. With abortion, however, that would mean randomly selecting whether a woman carries an unintended pregnancy to term or ends it disturbing, unethical, and impossible. Instead, research on abortion and mental health outcomes must rely on what are known as observational studies. That means women choose whether to end or complete their pregnancy and then scientists follow those two groups over time to observe and compare their mental health outcomes. Scientists can make inferences about what they find in observational studies, but it's more challenging to draw a straight line between cause and effect. Efforts to untangle the relationship between pregnancy and a specific mental health experience, particularly when abortion is involved, often fall short, said Julia Little a professor of social work at Bryn Mawr College who specializes in research design and synthesis but does not publish on abortion. That comparison helps to lay bare a political agenda that's often more obsessed with protecting women from the potential effects of abortion than supporting women with the various emotional and psychological challenges of motherhood. Politicians, for instance, aren't clamoring to pass laws making it harder for women to get pregnant because they might experience postpartum depression, anxiety, or psychosis. More than 20 years ago, Mika Gisler, an epidemiologist and research professor of public health at the National Institute for Health and Welfare in Finland, published a study that anti-abortion activists have cited as proof that abortion can lead to suicide. He analyzed the mortality risk of more than 600,000 women in a national register who gave birth or had an abortion. In his 1996 BMJ study, those who ended a pregnancy were at a much higher risk of dying by suicide, and he found the same to be true again in a study published in the European Journal of Public Health, in May. But Gisler, after studying this cohort for two decades, believes there's a more complex explanation for the association between abortion and suicide. First, his studies can't account for pre-existing mental health conditions because the register lacks detailed information about their experiences. Gisler also thinks that motherhood itself largely reduces risky behavior like self-harm. The Finnish healthcare system plays a critical role as well by giving teenage mothers, 
the subject of his latest study, Intense Support During and After Pregnancy. Teens who have an abortion don't get the same reinforcements. Though his 1996 study noted the possibility that abortion might negatively affect women, he holds no reservations now. It's quite clear it's not the abortions, he said. It's the complex situation of the women. Abortion and suicide, he noted, share the same risk factors, including economic instability and limited education. Gisler said he's been courted by anti-abortion researchers, some of whom he characterizes as well-versed in statistics but lacking expertise in mental or reproductive health epidemiology. They are making wrong conclusions and really bad science, if you can even call it science, he said. The goal of any such research should be to uncover the truth and share that with women and patients, said Chelsea B. Polis, co-author of the Contraception Study and a senior research scientist at the Guttmacher Institute. If that seems self-evident, consider that the debate over abortion and mental health is a lot like the controversy that has plagued research on climate change, evolution, or vaccines. A vocal group of researchers sees the scientific consensus as the product of bias, ethical misconduct, or even conspiracy and sows doubt at every possible turn. This isn't just professional disagreement it quickly begins to look like an ideological struggle. Those who had an abortion did not experience higher rates of anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, or low life satisfaction than those who were denied the procedure. In fact, women turned away from a clinic because they exceeded the facility's gestational limit initially had higher levels of anxiety, lower self-esteem and less life satisfaction than those who had the procedure. Between 6 and 12 months, however, all of the women had similar mental health outcomes throughout the remainder of the study. I think that if the claim is to protect women's mental health, what researchers are finding is that allowing women to make decisions and access care is more protective than denying them care, M. Antonia Biggs, the study's lead author, said. The study garnered praise as providing the best scientific evidence on the mental health effects of abortion from a former director of reproductive health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. However, Priscilla K. Coleman, a professor of human development and family studies at Bowling Green State University whose own body of work consistently demonstrates a relationship between abortion and increased risk for mental health problems, criticized the study as methodologically flawed in a self-published rebuttal, and suggested there was a broader conspiracy to publish fraudulent results that bolstered the case for abortion rights. If we really wanted to promote an agenda, we would have wanted to find more negative outcomes for the women denied abortion, said Biggs, who is a social psychologist researcher with advancing new standards in reproductive health, a research group at the University of California at San Francisco. Coleman said that she supports waiting periods and sensitive, individualized pre-abortion counseling and will oppose abortion until well-designed studies demonstrate it is beneficial to women. Coleman has served as a paid expert witness in abortion-related legal cases and for legislatures that considered restrictive measures, but her research has also been thoroughly critiqued. We have to promote sexual and reproductive health and mental health, and have a checkup after the abortion to avoid any suicide risk instead of restricting women's possibility to terminate pregnancy when they need it, Gisler recently said. In 2011, Coleman published a controversial study in the British Journal of Psychiatry. It attracted some support, but also prompted several letters of concern from researchers across disciplines who said the meta-analysis was poorly designed and didn't account for the quality of the evidence it cited. Little argued that it violated basic rules for synthesizing scientific research and called for its retraction. The editor declined to do so, a point Coleman raises in defense of her work. Whether women might need emotional or psychological support after an abortion is an important public health question. The National Abortion Federation advises clinics to provide patients with counseling referrals and resources, and all medical providers must abide by informed consent laws and present patients with information about the procedure, its risks, and alternatives. Lawmakers opposed to abortion, however, just don't believe any of those measures go far enough. Madera believes that counseling should be easily accessible for abortion patients.
her intimate knowledge of other people's abortion experiences, along with her own at the age of 17, has made her skeptical of competing social or political narratives that abortion is always traumatic or always simple. You can make the choice to have an abortion and still feel complicated feelings about it, she said. Instead of acknowledging that reality, though, politicians are using it to justify restricting a woman's right to choose in the first place. If you want to talk about your abortion experience and related feelings, call Exhale at 1-866-4-EXHALE. The after-abortion talk line is staffed by nonjudgmental volunteer counselors.